Um, this morning, we extend a warm welcome to two first-time Journal Club presenters and wonderful geriatric medicine residents, Dr. Alex Day, PGY4, and Dr. Jenny Wang, also PGY4. We will start with Alex uh, presenting as the title uh, states on major GI bleeding. Alex, uh, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Gendel. Um, so again, my name is Alex and I'm gonna be discussing um, a recent trial uh, that was uh, examining uh, some of the data from the 2018 ASPRI trial. Um, so I, uh, let's see if I can move this forward. Uh, so no disclosures and we're gonna move right along. So just to begin with um, a quick case to get the uh, blood flowing through the brain. So let's just quickly think about um, a lady named Betty who's 91 years old, she has dementia. She lives at home with her daughter, dependent for all IADLs and independent for most of her ADLs. Her medical history includes stable angina, dyslipidemia, Dys chronic kidney disease, and she's an ex-smoker. Um, and then in terms of medication, she's on aspirin, perindoprol, bisoprolol, and atorvastatin. She's referred to uh, your geriatric outpatient clinic after being admitted to hospital uh, for a GI bleed that required transfusion. And then uh, after that, she had delirium. Uh, following her discharge from hospital, her aspirin was restarted. So the question I pose to the group is, uh, after seeing this patient, um, she's recovered from delirium. Uh, she doesn't have any more signs of bleeding. Uh, would you stop her aspirin? Uh, and uh, maybe I'll just open to the floor. You can throw into the comments uh, whether or not uh, you'd be comfortable stopping her aspirin at this point. But I'm, I'm going to move ahead. Um, but please uh, your number, your answers down. So just to quickly discuss the ASPRI 2018 trial. Uh, this was a trial that demonstrated in healthy community dwelling older adults that low dose aspirin uh, did not have any beneficial effects on the occurrence of dementia, physical disability, cardiovascular events, or death from any cause. It was an important study uh, that um, together with trials at the same time period arrive and ascend, both kind of um, showed evidence that aspirin for primary prevention might not actually be such a great idea. Um, ARRIVE was a trial that showed that low-dose aspirin was not effective for primary prevention of cardiovascular events in people with moderate cardiovascular risk. And the SEND was looking at people uh, with well-controlled diabetes um, taking low-dose aspirin. And it showed that even though vascular events were very slightly reduced, there was uh, increased cost of uh, major bleeding. Uh, so these three studies combined um, in 2018 um, led to the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association changing their guidelines and recommending against low-dose aspirin for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease in people over 70 years old. So the study I'm gonna examine in more detail today um, is this one here. Uh, as I mentioned, it's building off of the data from the 2018 ASPRI trial. Uh, it's a multi-center between Australia and the United States randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study. And its general aim is to assess the impact of aspirin and other risk factors on serious GI bleeding in an older population. So an overview of the trial, um, it uh, included people over 70 years old for the most part. Uh, 91 par participants were white, um, but they did increase the age if uh, they were black or Hispanic to over 65. The median age of those who participated were set, was 74 years old. And then they did have quite um, significant exclusion criteria. So they were really targeting uh, a well community population. So people with dementia, previous cardiovascular disease, severe physical disability, which they, um, which they measured through ADLs performance. Uh, if they have a high risk of bleeding, uh, they were excluded. So high risk of bleeding included things like uh, cerebral or aortic aneurysms, liver disease, uh, esophageal varices, uh, peptic ulcers, uh, GI malignancies, uh, anything like this, they were excluded. Uh, and then the intervention was um, placebo versus the intervention group being aspirin, 100 milligrams daily. And they did a really good job of retaining people in this trial. Um, they had a phone call every three months uh, to encourage uh, people to continue in the trial and had an annual visit 
um, with uh, uh, the study um, every year. So uh, overall in the ESPRI trial, they had uh, over 19,000 participants. These people were randomized to aspirin or placebo group. And then uh, for the purpose of this study, uh, they took that number and they examined uh, how many people of the group that had uh, bleeding events had uh, gastrointestinal bleeding events. Now, um, I'll just drop this in here to explain a bit further about uh, how they determined what a gastrointestinal bleeding event was. They use a pretty, what I would uh, consider a pretty high uh, standard for what was considered a GI bleeding event. So in order to qualify, you had to have both, one, uh, bleeding that was substantiated by medical documentation. So this meant uh, that um, a doctor had to note in the chart that they had melina, uh, hematochesia, uh, and then as well, um, they needed to have bleeding that had required admission to hospital, a transfusion, or a prolonged hospitalization or death. Uh, so uh, I would consider this a pretty high bar. Um, and then from this information, um, oh, sorry, I'll just mention that they, they, they followed up this group for 4.7 years. Uh, they didn't intend to follow this group for longer, uh, but because uh, the, uh, this, the study was stopped um, after 4.7 years on, on, on median, um, due to it becoming quite clear that the aspirin group uh, was not doing as well. So in terms of results, um, it was quite clear from the study that there were significantly more upper GI bleeds in the aspirin arm. Um, and uh, we're talking about hazard ratios here. So uh, as someone interested in education, I couldn't help but take the opportunity to maybe explain a bit more about what exactly is uh, a hazard ratio. Uh, so um, what's important here is that, uh, to th remember that a hazard ratio is a measure of uh, the effect of an intervention. So in this case, the effect of aspirin on the outcome of interest, or so GI bleeding, over a period of time. And uh, the numbers we're looking at here are telling us what the, the probability that an individual in this uh, study is going to experience uh, a GI bleed after being exposed to the intervention of aspirin. So in this case, uh, if the hazard ratio is 0.5, for example, uh, this means that half as many people in the intervention group are going to be experiencing the event as a control group. And if the hazard ratio is two, then twice as many people uh, in the intervention group are expected to experience the event com compared to the control group. So for upper GI bleeds, for example, uh, this is where we see the most significant association between aspirin and GI bleeds. Um, the hazard ratio is 1.87. So then we can say that in the group that received aspirin, uh, at any point in the study, the people on this uh, side of the study were nearly twice as likely to suffer an upper GI bleed than people given the placebo. And that we're 95% confident that the hazard ratio truly lies between 1.32 and 2.66. And then we'll just point out uh, that the uh, event rate, which is just below that, um, uh, is measured in something called person years. Uh, and so this is important just to realize that although upper GI bleeds were significantly associated with uh, aspirin use, the overall rate of upper GI bleeds in the study as a whole is quite low. So if you take the numbers alone, it's 0.9% uh, upper GI bleeds in the aspirin side of the study. And so event, uh, the event rate measured in person years means that uh, if you followed uh, a thousand people for one year, you would expect to see just one more bleed in the aspirin group. So then we, so we're just like, if you're looking under the upper GI bleed section here and the event rate is 2.1 per 1,000 person years in the aspirin group, 1.1 per 1,000 person years in the placebo group. You subtract those, it's just a difference of one bleed if you're following a thousand people for one year. So uh, although the aspirin is associated with um, significantly more bleeds, uh, the actual absolute number of bleeds is quite low. So other results from the study included um, the authors trying to uh, delineate what the risk factors were for increasing the chances that someone on aspirin 
would have uh, a GI bleed. And from the data, uh, they determined that uh, the factors of advancing age, uh, if they had ever smoked in their life, uh, if they have hypertension, if they have chronic kidney disease, uh, and if they're obese, these were the factors that were significantly uh, associated with increased risk of having a GI bleed while on aspirin. And to further uh, elucidate uh, these risk factors, you can see just uh, in the middle here, um, the absolute five-year risk for an upper GI bleed for someone who's 80 years old, if they're not on aspirin, it's 0.52%. But if you add aspirin to this person's medical medication list, and then you also throw in the risk factors listed above, the absolute five-year risk for upper GI bleed for someone who's 80 years old increases to 5.76%. So that's quite significant, uh, especially if you look at the uh, confidence interval, it increases, it's all the way up to uh, 11%. And then interestingly, um, they did look at PPI use in uh, the people in the study, and they found that uh, people who were using PPIs throughout the course of the study um, on the aspirin side, uh, they found that the PPI was not associated with a reduced risk of GI bleeding. Um, and uh, I think uh, overall, I, after I read this result, I was quite surprised. Um, but I'd say that uh, after I looked through some of the more, uh, more recent evidence around PPI use uh, and uh, GI bleeding in patients on long-term aspirin, I was surprised to see that uh, actually, the evidence for PPI use and long-term aspirin use is not so robust uh, that uh, there's very weak evidence and a lot of uh, conflicting evidence. Uh, so this may have been due to a lack of power, as this, the, uh, the uh, authors of the study indicated. Uh, but it's just important to remember that actually there, this, the evidence for PPIs isn't great. So in terms of our critical appraisal today, uh, just to discuss whether the study is valid. So as I mentioned, it does meet the high bar of it being a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind study. Uh, both groups of patients uh, on both sides of the study uh, were similar. Uh, in terms of the outcomes measured, they were the same in both groups. And as I discussed before, I feel as though the, um, the high bar of clinically significant bleeding is important to mention. Um, it required uh, both documentation of bleeding and hospitalization. Um, and uh, it would not take into consideration someone who we've seen before who uh, is on an anticoagulant or aspirin and they've been having clearly a slow bleed or hemoglobin has been ticking down. Um, they're anemic and they have a fall and they go to hospital after the fall and they have delirium. So um, their high bar of what counts as a, as a GI bleed uh, wouldn't necessarily include other potential poor outcomes um, from um, a, a slow GI bleed, for example. Uh, and then uh, just to mention, as I said before, the study did stop after uh, 4.7 years due to a lack of clear benefit in the aspirin group, um, but this does seem like a reasonable amount of follow-up time. And the next question is, is the study uh, clinically important? And uh, is, the study, is, is the patient in the study one of our patients? And I think it's clear to us that someone who is well um, community dwelling and over 70 is certainly someone we see in our clinics, but um, for the most part, we are also seeing people uh, who are more complicated uh, than uh, the patients in the study who are more frail and have a lot more comorbidities. Uh, and so then ultimately, how, is, how are the results of the study going to change our practice? And I think the take home message here is that uh, there's an opportunity here for deep prescribing. Um, and as a budding geriatrician, there's nothing I like more than stopping uh, a patient's medication. So for uh, aspirin use in primary prevention of cardiovascular disease, I think the evidence is quite strong uh, that we should be stopping aspirin uh, for uh, this indication. Uh, but then the question I, I kind of want to make, uh, well, I want to pose to the group and the, the statement I want to make that I think uh, is maybe a bit more, a lot more controversial would be around aspirin for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Um, I think that there's a, there is a, quite a bit of evidence, there was a bit of, a, quite a bit of strong evidence that aspirin is important for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And I think that uh, in most of our patients who we think can tolerate the aspirin, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good enough reason to have them uh, continue on the aspirin. But 
Um, again, after reviewing some of the literature, um, it's worth noting that uh, the evidence that supported aspirin for secondary prevention is quite old, outdated. Um, of course, it did not involve patients that we typically see in, in clinic. So frail um, 90 plus year olds with multi <clears throat> multimorbidity. Uh, and when a lot of these studies that looked uh, at aspirin for secondary prevention were published, uh, medications um, that we now uh, use as standard in management of coronary artery disease, such as beta blockers, statins, uh, these weren't um, as prevalent. Uh, so it's just to say that um, in someone like Betty, who's in her 90s, uh, who's had a GI bleed, who um, is maybe someone who um, we want, might want to have a conversation uh, with this patient around whether or not we want to continue aspirin for secondary prevention, because there is some evidence that uh, aspirin is going to continue to cause GI bleeding. Uh, and maybe the evidence for secondary prevention might not be as strong as we think it is. Um, I just want to throw that out there for, for as food for thought. Uh, and so just to conclude quickly, um, the study that we, I, I just discussed uh, is uh, showing that community dwelling, healthy, older adults um, using aspirin was significantly associated with more GI bleeds compared to placebo. Uh, the risk factors that increase someone's risk of bleeding on aspirin include advanced age, smoking history, hypertension, CKD, and obesity. Uh, I, th I think that the study and the other ones from 2018 that I mentioned uh, make it clear that aspirin should not be used for, prim for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease in older adults. And um, maybe you might wanna start to think about um, whether or not uh, your patients who are older and frail and have many multimorbidities uh, using aspirin for secondary prevention, if um, uh, secondary prevention uh, is worth the risk of uh, bleeding. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I'll open up to the floor if there are any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Alex, for a very clear uh, presentation, uh, particularly around the risk. Uh, Barry has a comment in the chat box. We see aspirin and beta blockers 15 years after a bypass, and he wonders if benefit wanes after years of therapy. We have time for uh, one or two questions. Uh, please either raise your hand in the chat box or uh, unmute. Gary has his hand up. Please unmute, Gary. Thank you. Thanks very much for an uh, excellent presentation, uh, Alex. I just wanted to raise a point around the finding related to PPIs. If you notice, the confidence interval uh, was extremely wide and could have missed up to a 40% benefit from PPI. So it suggests that their finding around PPI is inconclusive given the very wide confidence interval. Yep, absolutely. I think um, that uh, definitely points to it, that finding not being well powered. Um, but it did kind of raise um, an eyebrow to me. Uh, I thought that, that that would certainly be um, more conclusive uh, based on my practice of using PPIs in people who I'm concerned about bleeding from an antiplatelet agent. Um, so then I did go back to, I did go to some of the evidence um, and um, I can't remember this, the names of the authors, but there were studies from the last uh, five years looking at systematic reviews of PPIs in long-term low-dose aspirin use, trying to prevent GI bleeds. And as I mentioned, the evidence wasn't great. Thank you, Alex. Any other questions or comments for Alex? Okay, with that, uh, thank you very much, Alex, for a great presentation. And uh, we'll move on to Dr. Jenny Wang, who I saw online, also PGY4 geriatric medicine subspecialty resident with a presentation on low dose endoxaban. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Jenny. I, I will just uh, put my presentation on. All right. Um, 
Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to present this morning on the low-dose idoxaban in very elderly patients with uh, atrial fibrillation study. Um, this is the elder care AF trial. Uh, I'm Jenny and um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. We will talk about this morning um, stroke and systemic um, embolization prevention in non-valvular atrial fibrillation uh, patients and outline specifically the literature in uh, direct oral anticoagulants. We will review this study's methods and results and provide critical appraisal of the study. And hopefully um, I will initiate the discussion on its implications. Um, we know that atrial fibrillation increases with age as our older adults are at higher risk of hypertension, coronary artery disease and valvulopathy. The most dev devastating complication of atrial fibrillation is an arterial embolism of left atrial uh, thrombus resulting in an ischemic stroke. Um, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation in patients over the age of 80 is estimated at 10 to 15 percent, and atrial fibrillation is associated with a three to six fold increased risk of stroke or systemic embolization. We know that for a patient with non-valvular atrial fibrillation and a CHAT score of three, it has a stroke rate of 6.9 per um, 100 patient years. Moreover, um, both atrial fibrillation and age are in are independent risk factors for stroke. Um, DOACs are the first line of therapy for stroke prevention in older adults with non-valvular atrial, uh, atrial fibrillation, but the limit, the, the, the information on use of DOACs in the very elderly population is still limited. Um, here I listed the four DOACs um, and the associate studies um, in the chronological order. And all the four approved DOACs actually rapid, re, rapidly reach a peak plasma concentration within usually 30 to four hours, enabling the very early onset of their anticoagulation effect. Um, they share a relative relatively short elimination half-life of 12 hours. And again, the half-life of DOACs and really vary with the age and renal function. Um, I think it's also um, an interesting question, and the current expert opinion is quite divided regarding daily dosing um, DOACs versus uh, BID dosing uh, DOACs. Some experts would argue that twice daily dosing uh, or anticoagulants are more protective, and missing once daily dose would have greater impact on anticoagulation, whereas others would argue that daily dosing would lead to better um, adherence and persistence to therapy. So um, these are uh, actually tables taken out from Thrombosis Canada, and this is a summary of the four indicated DOACs for stroke and systemic embolism protection for non-valvular atrial fibrillation patients uh, as per our Canadian guidelines. These guidelines suggest to avoid DOACs um, when the patient has a creatinine clearance less than 30, except for a Pixaban, which has um, a special uh, lower threshold in terms of the uh, creatinine clearance where we can tolerate up to 15 um, of uh, creatinine clearance. Just a quick word on edoxaban. Um, edoxaban is a direct factor 10A inhibitor, like apixaban and rivaroxaban. The lower dose edoxaban 15 milligrams daily used in this study that will, I will present is off-label. And um, the medication um, dose is actually um, one fourth of the current approved dose of edoxaban. Um, this medication is manufactured by Daichi Sankyo, uh, which is the company who has sponsored this, uh, the study that I will present. And the current two indications for edoxaban uh, are stroke and systemic embolism prevention in all valvular atrial fibrillation patients and uh, treatment of uh, DVTs or pulmonary embolism. Currently, there's no approved antidote that exists for edoxaban. So um, just also as, uh, as um, uh, a preview of our study, um, the 15 milligrams dose of edoxaban was selected based on the data from a previous trial. So the trial that really um, put the uh, edoxaban on the forefront, uh, forefront um, was the Engage AF TIMI 48 trial. And this uh, is uh, also combined with the pharmacokinetic study in the elderly uh, Japanese patients with atrial fibrillation. Edoxaban was shown to have a similar protection than warfarin in terms of the stroke and systemic embolism risk with lower risk of major bleeding. 
However, in uh, the ENGAGE AF TIMI 48 trial, only 17% of patients were uh, 80 or above, and 4% of the patients were aged uh, 85 or older. So I think uh, important questions to, uh, to answer um, is really, again, is it safe to use anticoagulants on elderly patients? And um, I think many of us have encountered patients who are considered inappropriate candidates for oral anticoagulants based on their renal impairment or their bleeding risk. I actually remember uh, multiple consults at Baycrest um, that were kind of um, addressing this uh, or actually asking this question. And um, I thought that was interesting uh, in the literature, actually, many clinicians are faced with the question uh, if, you know, using anticoagulants, it's safe in the elderly population. And um, there is a phenomenon of prescription paralysis where clinicians are less likely to prescribe oral anticoagulants uh, in patients over 75 and frail. It's strange, but some clinicians may consider that if, if the patient bleed on an, uh, on an anticoagulant, um, then it's the prescriber's uh, fault. Hence, many times we may uh, miss this opportunity to really provide protection in our uh, very individuals uh, who need it the most. So I will be talking about the elder care AF trial. And the study objective is to see if edoxaban low dose daily is a safe and efficacious medication for stroke and systemic embolism prevention in the ver very elderly non-volvular atrial fibrillation Japanese patients. The study's PICO question is, in Japanese patients older than 80 with non-volvular atrial fibrillation with a CHAT score of two or above, inappropriate who are inappropriate candidates to DOAC therapy at doses approved for stroke and systemic emboliz embolization, uh, embolism, sorry, um, does edoxaban 15 milligrams daily reduce risk of stroke and systemic embolism and cause more bleeding than placebo? So elder care AF is a phase three pharmaceutical company sponsored, multi-centered, randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled, event-driven superiority trial that was conducted in Japan. That was a mouthful. Um, and the inclusion criteria of this study were uh, patients of age 80 or older with a history of non-valvular atrial fibrillation with a CHAT score of two or higher, who are, in a, who are inappropriate candidates for oral anticoagulant. Um, either from their renal impairment, their history of bleeding, their low body weight, their continuous use of NSAIDs, or their concurrent uh, use of antiplatelets. I would like to point out that the last two um, indications here or uh, indications or for labeling these uh, candidates as inappropriate candidates for or anticoagulants are not typical contraindications that we know. Um, and as you, you saw in the Thrombosis Canada guidelines, uh, these were not listed. Um, so um, in terms of the exclusion criteria, there were actually many, and there were 22 criteria that were only listed in the supplementary appendix. Um, a, criteria that, a few criteria that I have highlighted here include patients with lower hemoglobin, um, so hemoglobin under um, 90 or platelets under 10, um, with poor clear, clear, creatinine clearance, so uh, poorer than the 30 that, that was presented earlier. Um, these actually patients with claritin clearance under 15 were excluded, um, patients with severe heart failure and patients that the investigator or the sub-investigator considered uh, ineligible, uh, which we don't, really don't know what it means. In terms of the outcomes, the primary and secondary outcomes were divided into efficacy and safety. Um, the efficacy outcomes were about risk of stroke and systemic embolism, whereas the safety outcomes focus on the bleeding risk. So um, we're at the results section and uh, really uh, the study uh, between 2016 and 2019 enrolled a total of 1,086 patients. Of the 102 patients that were excluded, 79 patients did not meet eligibility criteria, something that I will cover on the uh, next slide. 984 patients underwent randomization. Half of these were assigned to receive edoxaban. Half of these uh, received uh, placebo. And from both groups, around 60, pa uh, 60 patients passed away, leaving a total of 340 patients uh, 
uh, on both sides. So uh, it is worth mentioning that these patients who died were included in the safety um, outcomes analysis later on. Um, so of these 79 patients who did not meet eligibility criteria, um, 23 were excluded from high bleeding risk. So one of the um, four uh, criteria presented here um, and 19 patients were excluded by the investigator or sub-investigator for unknown or unreported reasons. Uh, 12 were uh, excluded as after upon review, they actually could receive uh, DOAX at the approved dosage. Um, and seven were excluded because of very low uh, creatinine clearance under uh, 15. Looking at table one, so mean patient age was 86.6 years, and more of half of the study were female. About half of the patients had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and the median weight was 50.6 kilogram, which is quite low. And the mean creatinine clearance was 66, uh, sorry, 36.3, uh, which is it's interesting because it's above um, the threshold by Thrombosis Canada guidelines. Um, I also took another table from the supplementary appendix um, just to highlight kind of the, the, the three major reasons why patients were considered inappropriate candidates to usual or anticoagulants. Um, so the three major reasons were their severe renal impairment, their low body weight, and the continuous use of NSAIDs. I would like to highlight that there were more um, placebo patients who were taking continuous NSAIDs comparing to the edoxaban group, which could increase their uh, bleeding risk. So um, continue di uh, continuing to dissect the table one, we see that the mean CHAT score was 3.1, which means that the study population was at high risk of strokes. But when we're comparing our edoxaban and placebo group again, we see that the placebo group had more patients who had dementia, a history of fall in the last year, and um, they were more frail. The study's uh, biggest results are here in this table here. Um, the hazard ratio was 0.34%. Uh, um, and uh, this means that the edoxaban provided a 66% reduction in stroke and um, systemic embolism uh, risk. So um, the confidence interval here is a wide, probably because of the small number of events. So there was also an increase in the primary safety outcome for major bleeding in the doxaban group versus the placebo group. Uh, a non-significant p-value uh, for such a difference reflects the insufficient uh, statistical power of the study and the 1.5% of absolute risk reduction in major bleeding was explained by the threefold, so uh, three times more bleeding on the GI, uh, sorry, uh, of a GI bleeding in the doxaban group than the placebo group. So the author's conclusion was that in very elderly Japanese patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation who were not appropriate candidates for standard or anticoagulation anti -coagulation regimen, a once daily 15 milligram dose of edoxaban was superior to placebo in preventing stroke or systemic embolism um, and did not result in a significantly higher incidence of major bleeding than placebo. I will start my critical appraisal with the internal validity of this study. So to answer the first question regarding randomization, there was a randomization one by one in a permuted blocks of four with use of interactive response technology system, according to a schedule pre uh, prepared by an independent individual. Um, I think the groups were not um, perfectly similar. There was some imbalance in the doxaban group uh, versus the placebo groups. Um, so I highlighted the fact that, you know, something that was only in the supplementary appendix about more continuous use of NSAIDs in the edoxaban, edoxa, sorry, in the placebo group, sorry. Um, and there was more frailty, dementia, and history of falls as well in the placebo group. Um, aside from the allocated treatment, um, were the groups treated equally? So um, as far as I can tell from the study, it seems that they, they did that. So um, they, they talk about how they were using tests that, um, you know, any tests that, that could compromise the masking of the trial group assignments were prohibited. And they, they had the similar follow-up in both groups. 
Um, I do wish that they talk a little bit more about how um, maybe the pill or um, how the packaging and everything uh, was uh, the same or not, but um, that was not something that was mentioned in the study. Now, continuing talking about the internal validity, um, we we had quite a, a high discontinu discontinuation uh, rate in this trial, which was 31% in both groups. Um, I thought that was good that they still included patients who died uh, in the safety outcome analysis. So um, I think that the blinding was was done. Um, they mentioned that patients, investigators, and sponsor were unaware of the trial group assignments. Um, how large was the treatment effect? So looking at the primary outcomes, starting with the efficacy outcome, um, adoxaban was able to reduce a stroke or systemic embolism by 66% with the absolute risk uh, reduction of 4.4% um, uh, with the NNT of 23. So we have to um, treat 23 persons uh, with adoxaban to uh, reduce one uh, uh, one stroke. Um, and the primary safety outcome, which uh, again showed that adoxaban increased a major bleeding risk by 87%. But again, we have to take this with a grain of salt as the confidence interval was wide and the, the p-value was uh, not significant. Uh, anyway, the uh, absolute re uh, risk reduction was 1.5% with the number needed to harm at 67 so um, how precise were the estimates of the uh, treatment effect? Um, again, I think I showed a little bit earlier, but the confidence intervals were wide. And um, that is probably because of the small number uh, of events that happened. Um, and now talking about the external validity, um, I think that this um, it's clear that this study is maybe a little bit different than our uh, population that we see every day. Um, so this study was uh, only Japanese patients, and we know that mostly East Asian patients with the previous trial, so uh, engaged to me um, AF48 trial, um, East Asian patients are more at risk of bleeding. They have a lower weight and they have a lower renal clearance. Currently, uh, we can use edoxaban. So the treatment is visible in our setting, um, but the 50 milligrams uh, dose is um, still off label. Um, I think that the, the, the benefits and the risk is always interesting in the anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation patients because um, as the guidelines mention it uh, very well, and as we do it every day, um, it's always a discussion that have to uh, that has to happen. So um, in terms of the stroke prevention versus the, the GI bleeding, um, I think that we, when we think about GI bleeding specifically, we always think about strategies to prevent GI bleeding. So adding a PPI, um, if my patient had, uh, uh, you know, double antiplatelet therapy or uh, antiplatelet therapy with an anticoagulation, there's indication for uh, PPI prescription. Um, so uh, I think that we cannot um, talk about the change uh, in mortality, and the study also mentioned that, that, that there was no change of, of mortality, but again, this is because the study was only conducted for three years, so not long enough to, to uh, maybe see that difference of uh, mortality. Um, so uh, as a summary, I think the study had a few strengths. Um, the first trend was the fact that the study was large, multi-centered, randomized, and double-blinded. Uh, double blinded. Uh, in, it's, the, the study really included an older population than all the previous um, DOAC trials that I mentioned in the beginning. It really included also population that was considered inappropriate and often excluded from previous trials. Um, and this is because this population is at high risk of bleeding and stroke. Um, now mentioning the uh, limitations of the the study, there were some there were, sorry there there were definitely conflicts of interest um, and uh, the, given the full pharmaceutical um, sponsorship of the trial, um, I listed here uh, something that they had the, in their disclosures and basically there were forty three pages of um, authors and they all had um, some affiliations to um, pharmaceutical company and they were paid uh, through uh, grants and personal fees. Um, I think that it's also interesting that they all they didn't um, include patients who had aspirin or antiplatelet or 
both. Um, I think that's something that we actually see a lot in our population. So it would have been interesting to kind of see how they, these patients would have um, uh, had in terms of the bleeding risk. Um, the high trial discontinuation rate cannot be ignored, but it was good that it was similar in both groups and um, unrelated to bleeding. Um, and I thought that I thought that was kind of fun to kind of dig in, a little bit into the Daichi Sankyu company, uh, which is the second largest um, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company in Japan, and they have uh, quite a high revenue of two thousand three hundred uh, and five uh, billion in revenue in two thousand eighteen, and the current stock price is forty seven bucks. Um, they also sponsored the uh, Kuze um, VT trial, which really has, uh, for me, put edoxaban on the map. Um, continuing with some limitations of this trial, I thought there was some discordance between edoxaban and the, the placebo group in terms of the use of NSAIDs, frailty, and history, uh, history of falls and dementia. Um, and again, I'm repeating myself, but the patient population was um, of much lower weight. Uh, and um, the study didn't really mention any GI bleeding prevention strategies as PP, such as PPIs. Um, and I thought it was also kind of interesting thinking back with my Canadian guidelines about how, um, you know, if I had patients with the median, uh, a patient population with the median creatinine clearance of 36, um, then I wouldn't necessarily exclude them. I was still thinking, think about prescribing the lower dose of uh, DOAX. Um, we cannot comment on the mortality of this uh, um, paper, given that it was a shorter trial, so only three years of duration. And I think this um, study for me has a few implications. The first one is that I have one more reason to ensure that my patients are getting the uh, anticoagulation. Um, so again, age and frailty are not reasons to preclude uh, a patient from uh, the proper management and stroke prevention. And clinically, I would still discuss risk and benefits of anticoagulation with my patient and consider an individualized approach with maybe shared care management with their cardiologist or their hematologist and uh, gastroenterologist if there's a uh, possibly or previous you know uh, risk of bleeding like a peptic ulcer. Uh, despite the caveats of this study um, I would consider using a reduced dose of DOAX such as apixaban 2.5 uh, that began to run 110 and riroxaban 15. It has really piqued my interest in kind of um, uh, looking after those uh, trials, uh, and especially in these, um, if uh, there's any study on the uh, lower dose of DOAX in these inappropriate candidates. So I think further research is definitely required to compare one DOAC to another and uh, to also continue to do some um, safety cost effectiveness um, analysis uh, comparing one DOAC to another. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm sorry if I was um, talking quite a bit. Um, thank you. Jenny, that was uh, fabulous. Quite an excellent presentation. Your point is very well taken that many of us may be prescribing uh, apixaban or other lower dose DOAX for these uh, patients. I'm gonna open the first question to uh, Dr. Watt. Uh, great, great presentation, Jenny, really informative. Um, and this, like, there was a lot to talk about. So you did a really nice summary of, of everything that the authors did and, and the messages that they hope to convey. So that was really great. My question for you is actually about, um, you know, how they used systemic embolism or a systemic embolic event as one of their outcomes. I thought it was actually um, really interesting in that like 20% of the events in their primary composite outcome were actually these systemic embolic events. And so I was hoping that you, because um, they didn't really talk a lot about what that is. And I think it's actually a really important concept because um, we focus on, uh, you know, the cerebral events, strokes so much, but these other systemic embol emboli are actually really important too. So um, can you just uh, talk a little bit about, you know, what is a systemic embolic event and, and why is it an important outcome? 
Oh, sorry. Um, I, I'm not muted. That's good. Okay. Um, so uh, systemic embolism. I think yes, absolutely. It's 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 it's. I, I I actually wanted to add that, but I feel like there was so many things to talk about this study, and um, I I actually um deleted quite a few slides as uh, I I saw that the time was uh you know way too long. Um, but I think so. Reviewing also the thrombosis Canada guidelines. Um, systemic embolism is definitely important as it can really cause an organ damage. So imagining if you have a thrombosis a thrombus to your kidneys, to your liver, um, or to your lower limbs, then you have uh, limb ischemia. And this, you know, it has really um, dreadful uh, consequences. Um, and um, it's it's a good question. Actually, I, I'm not 100% sure how they did it. I don't think, and reading into details, you know, reading the, the 40 pages of the um, appendix didn't really tell me how they actually did that. Um, I, I don't know if anyone has a better uh, answer. Um, no, and I'm that's sorry. the thing is that, you know, considering it was part of their primary outcome, I don't think that they explained well enough, you know, what it was they were looking for, you know, if they just maybe, I don't know, in Japan, if it's like a much more sort of common thing and the clinicians like more imaging mm -hmm. to understand it better. But I thought that was kind of an oversight that they didn't spend more time talking about what that was and, and how it, um, you know, what what were the different end organ dysfunctions that resulted from, from these events? Because it was a big part of their outcome. Very good point. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, so there's a comment in the chat box from Thiru uh, that uh, there may have been some ethical concerns about comparing uh, with placebo, uh, given uh, kind of ex expands on the point that you were making in your implications. Um, does anybody else have uh, any questions or comments? Please raise your hand in the chat box or unmute. Yes, uh, I just wanted to congratulate you on, um, you know, your precise um, highlighting of the methodological issues associated with this study. And also, you know, the huge concern about the conflict of interest and the possible undue pressure for showing positive data uh, given uh, the influence of the company on the funding of the trial. Thank you so much, Dr. Norris. Um, can I answer the question regarding the um, ethical issue um, regarding the comparison to placebo? So the study actually did um, talk about this um, briefly. Um, they, they said that they, um, they did, uh, sorry, they compared with the placebo because there's no um, standard treatment. So there's no reference tra treatment currently um, in our uh, sorry, in our very elderly population. So they did mention it, but um, again, I agree. It, you know, again, um, the the cl uh, the creatinine clearance was not actually that low. And I think if we did this study in Canada, um, we would just compare it with the other DOACs. We would just use a lower dose, and not even the fifteen milligrams. We'd have we, we would probably have used the thirty milligrams of idoxaban um, in these patients. Thank you, Jenny. There's another uh, question coming through the chat box from Jill Alston. Uh, excellent presentation. Did they speak about why they limited the CHADs to greater or equal to two? Um, that's a very good question. Um, they did not mention why um, they uh, didn't want to include any of the lower risk patients. Um, but looking at the exclusion criteria, um, you know, our, our, I think the, the major reason was patients who had um, lower CHAD score were, were already like too good and they, they received actually approved a dosage of the, uh, the just the, our usual anticoagulants. So I, I'm kind of assuming, but it's true they didn't talk about that specifically. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments from the group? If not, um, we'll end a little bit early today. I want to thank both Alex and Jenny um, uh, for tremendous, excellent first presentations. Uh, both seemed like they presented uh, many times before. So congratulations on superb <laughs> presentations. Um, and those comments are coming through the chat box as well. Uh, a few announcements. Um, please remember to complete the evaluations um, coming your way in uh, your inbox.
The next journal club is scheduled for Friday, December 11th, a little bit earlier in two short weeks uh, due to the winter holidays. And uh, please uh, 